So interestingly, I don't want to give the guy's name because I don't want to get him in trouble. But uh, what what I heard him say is like, yeah, I don't think anyone's paying attention to that. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's right. <laughs> I think most guys it's like are that's right too. Buying whatever is on the shelf that will fit in their gun. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. I'm joined by Deputy Editor Matt Milham. Hello. Design Editor Kylie Jacques. Hi there. And Producer Jeff Rose. Howdy. Please email us your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Wow. I'm always so excited. <laughs> well. <laughs> it's just so exciting. Nothing interesting has happened yet, Patrick. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we made just, it here. Yeah. Just, just the anticipation of all this good stuff we have. Mm-hmm. Uh, a getting, lot of similar questions today. Do you think? Well, not similar. They're like all, like I don't know, pertaining to a lot of the same kind of stuff. Okay. I didn't catch up on that. Did you? No, I think he's making that up. <laughs> um, a lot of eye joist questions. Oh, okay. That's fair. <laughs> So uh, first, some feedback uh, regarding podcast 216. We heard from Eldon from Carbondale, Illinois. Hey, guys, fun podcast. Listen every week. Seriously, why would you cut a hole in a concrete block wall with a saw? A hammer of most any size will work just fine. Just hit the blocks to be removed anywhere from between the webs, and it will break up easily. No dust. Add a masonry chisel to clean up the edges and remove mortar. Insert new blocks if the hole needs to be closed up. And this is in relation to the gentleman who had his inaccessible uh, crawl spaces, right? Mm -hmm. And Eldon is totally right. I was suggesting the saw because I've been living in uh, New England for 20 years where concrete foundations are the norm, but I forgot about how easy it is to break up concrete block with a hammer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I hit it with a two by four. But I mean... What if you're like an artisanal block cutter and you're, <laughs> you're really There are wh- so many of those. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then you can use a saw, of yeah. course, yeah. I don't know. Anytime there's a chance to chisel mortar off a of stone, I'm in. Okay. I like that task. I forget that gentleman's <laughs> name, but he might want to have you come <laughs> open up his basements. Yeah. Um, we also heard from Nelson from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Hello. Well, first off, thanks so much for entertaining my question about tearing apart the house, chasing potential water damage. So I don't know if you guys remember, but Nelson had a stucco house and he found water coming in above his door and wanted to know if he should rip all the plaster down to see if it was leaking. Mm. Yeah, I remember that. And uh, Kylie just fell down the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> Are you OK? I'm, I'm getting back up now. <laughs> So he says, uh, update, I opened up the wall as part of my kitchen renovation and discovered that there is, in fact, no insulation and mostly just water staining. I think I will go forgo, forgo further exploration, and I have a quote to blow in dense pack cellulose in the cavities. What do you think of that? I don't know. I didn't realize that this was a stucco house. I don't know yeah, how I feel about it at all. I don't know if you're supposed to do that, Nelson. I, I, I would worry. I would worry if, I mean, if he's taking care of the water issue. Right. Okay. But, but if it's the cellulose is going to be getting soaking wet, I think that's a problem. I yeah. thought you guys mentioned that when I originally um, brought so this up. Nelson, uh, how about <laughs> filling us in what you're doing exactly, and then we'll share some thoughts on that. But uh, Nelson was primarily uh, emailing us to talk about our query regarding uh, is there anything inherently wrong with a 9,000-square-foot deep energy retrofit. Mm. Uh, he that has, has some, sparked a lot of conversation. Agreed. Almost as much as Matt's uh, light <laughs> that you can't turn off. <laughs> that is a common he, thread. He says, uh, at a fundamental level, I think a house that huge is somewhat immoral. But as you also called for more design questions for Kylie, I wonder if we could re- redirect our conversation to the design realm rather than retrofit. In my experience, and according to current psychological research, the best way to make good decisions in life and everything else is to remove as much friction as possible that prevents those good choices. Do either of you know what he's talking about? Money. It's very philosophical. Money. Yeah, that's what it boils down to. Money yeah. removes all friction, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought know. that was alcohol. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that too. <laughs> That's how Amazon survives. In that light, it strikes me that problematic building practices also fall into this category, including energy efficiency, house site, functional layout, etc. I've seen some monstrous brand new houses that I think are A, grossly oversized, and B, not well designed, and C, not very pleasant to be in. The question is this, what are important design principles to think about to rein in our temptations? 
How do we decide how much space will be functional and satisfying, but not more than we need? How do we make more restrained design more attractive to the masses? Yes. I like this. I think he's asking you. Yes. Yeah. I have some answers. <laughs> well, I think the first and foremost, you need to make a small build really functional because people like convenience. So design for efficiencies, right? And I thought of the example just because it was on my plate recently. Um, to gang wet zones, which means shorter runs and less wait time for hot water. So, so put your bathrooms and, and uh, kitchen, kitchen stuff and, and laundry close together yes. as possible. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. Um you should find ways to make a small build feel bigger. So smart floor plans are key to that. Rob Yeager did a piece called Five Smart uh, Five Small Home Plans to Admire, which is very informative. We also have one called The House Out Back, and that includes good tips for making the most out of small spaces, which, you, you know, open floor plan, lots of light, bonus space, outdoor access, neutral colors, vertical elements, good artificial lighting, and fewer furnishings. Those are all things that can make a small house feel bigger. Build-ins. Yes, that's one way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> I find so, that that makes my life better. We've lived in two small houses mm -hmm. and having places dedicated for storage that store the things that you own, mm -hmm. like made for your stuff, is very helpful. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. And he asked about how to um, make us, what was his question? How do we decide how much space will be functional? So. Uh, the Pretty Good House Guidelines mm -hmm. are something to keep in mind. Um, what does Su this, uh, Susanka say? 1,000 square feet for one person, 1,500 for two, 1,750 uh, for three, and 1,875 for four. And I then, can hear a number of our listeners in my head losing their minds. Uh, well, it, some it, people it, think it's those numbers are too small and others think they're too big. Yeah. So it's just a, they're pretty good targets. What do you think about those target square footages? They, it all comes down to layout. Like I live mm. in a roughly 1,300 square foot house now mm -hmm. and it feels really small because mm -hmm. it's a very just bizarre layout. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine what was going through these people's heads when they came up with it. <laughs> um, it was originally a three bedroom. We've turned it into a two and it has a basically non-functioning dining area. And I, I mean, I can't really see without ripping out all of the walls and sort of just relaying everything out. Um, figure out how I'm going to make sort of like a functional kitchen eating area without adding more square footage. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And I have the opposite experience where my place is all open concept with a lofted bedroom and it's 950 square feet. It's just me. And it feels like I could live with less. Yeah. Well, that's a thing. Square footage. Before this, I lived in a one-room schoolhouse that was less than 400 square feet. Right. <laughs> and I, it was all open. And it Did it feel tight? Fine. Yeah. I mean, it was a little tight, yeah. but I mean, I had uh, like a, my dining table in a sort of like kitchen area mm -hmm. and my, well, I mean, it, I had a, a porch that I had my bed out on. That helps. Yeah. Which helped a lot. Yeah. But, you know, the rest of it, it felt fine. Well, it also comes down to you have to know how to design minimalistically if that's mm -hmm. a word you know you have to keep things pretty simple make your furnishings a little smaller mm -hmm. um, i think all that don't stuff, have kids don't have kids yeah. <laughs> a number one <laughs> <laughs> but that schoolhouse i mean going back years the guy who still owns it now mm -hmm. he was there with his wife and three kids and wow. a bunch of dogs and cats and all this other okay, stuff. Okay, that sounds like hell. So <laughs> they made it work somehow. Wow, yeah, that's that was, impressive. That was why they added the porch so they would mm. have some some place to sleep. There was also, uh, at the point that I lived in it, they had moved the schoolhouse and it had a finished basement underneath. So there mm. was another roughly 300 square feet of space down there. But, mm -hmm. You know, not really a comfortable space to sleep in, but somebody did. Mm -hmm. I, You know... I, I have mixed feelings about the whole concept of, uh, you know, small, big, whatever. I, I like living in small spaces. I don't like cleaning. Mm -hmm. uh, I yeah. like paying lower taxes. I like yeah. paying lower heating bills. Cost efficiencies, But, right? like, for people who have lots of money or more money than me, like, how do you discourage them from building more house than they need? And how do you get them to see the light, I guess, is the genesis of this question. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. People like what they like. Yeah. You can't make people like something they don't like. Yep. But I mean, you can <laughs> educate people who maybe don't have a strong feeling one way or the other and really stress the cost efficiency. It's cheaper to build small. It's less expensive to buy a small house and it's less expensive to take maintain care of it. it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure people know that. But if you've got more <laughs> money than you know what to do with and, you know, I mean, are you going to go knock on doors to like educate them well like Jehovah's when you're Witnesses. talking about the masses i don't <laughs> yeah. think that's not the masses that's yeah. the one percent so right. you know I, th I think too that it's 
largely inertia. Well, I, I need a 3,000 square foot house because I've had a 3,000 mm-hmm. square foot house. Mm-hmm. Or I need a 10,000 square foot house because I've had a 10,000 square foot house or my neighbors do or whatever it is. It's just like... That's, that's why the, I try to find really good house projects to feature in the design departments and, and well because... You know, it's part on us to educate people about the benefits of living smaller. You know, I really, you know, there are a lot of beautiful houses out there that can inspire people who want to yeah. want to go smaller. Yeah, I but think I think more and more people are thinking about it these days. I think so. I don't know how many, like the whole millennial generation. Yeah, but I mean, you're you're talking about custom home building versus you know the sort of like. Yeah, factory what I think house. Of the yeah. Majority of houses that are getting built are not, you know, mm-hmm. not one offs. Yeah, and they're bigger, and yeah. they keep getting bigger, right? And right. It's now over twenty four hundred square feet, I believe, is mm-hmm. like the average new home size. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. You'd live in it. <laughs> You'd find <laughs> a way to fill it. I'd live in one room of it. <laughs> <laughs> I. How do you have that much furniture? I don't know. It's like. It's funny. I w- used to watch a lot more uh, HDTV than I do now. Mm-hmm. But like, you know, they'd have these makeover shows, and th- the makeover would be they would buy some furniture and like put it in the house because <laughs> previously they had these huge empty rooms with nothing in it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. When I lived in a big house, like I, I didn't want to live in this house. I was like scrambling oh, for months trying to find a, find a place to live. And it was and so I echoey, gave up. right? Yeah. And like when I moved in, it was just like an echo chamber. Where was this? <laughs> this was in Germany, in uh-huh. Kaiserslautern, Germany. And I, I ended up just buying, going to Ikea and probably spending $2,000 on Ikea on furniture. On junk furniture. <laughs> on junk furniture just to fill the space, just to make it, you know, livable. So um, my perception was that housing in Europe is much smaller than our, our, mm. our house. Was this just an exceptionally big one or was it just too big for your needs? It was just too big for my needs. I think, you know, if you were in there with a family, it would have been fine. Mm-hmm. But, you know, for a single guy, yeah. <laughs> it was way more than I needed. Yeah. And you weren't there a lot, it's right? It's weird to you're have traveling. a traveling. Well, at the time, I wasn't traveling a lot. Before that, I lived in a, a smaller apartment and had a, a, a housemate and mm-hmm. I was there yeah maybe like one week out of every two months and the rest of the time I was out of the country so yeah. I think matter. it feels strange and uncomfortable to have a whole bunch of empty rooms around oh I agree yeah. who the heck wants to clean it yeah like I, I see these homes with like acres of carpeting and yeah, I'm just like right <laughs> that's a really you good vacuum point that, yeah. you know yeah. weekly right. no right so thanks good. for the shout out to the design department <laughs> yeah agreed uh so we heard <laughs> We heard, so uh, do you want to tell us about your light that we talked about in 216? Yeah. Am I? <laughs> you're, you're, I, oh, I knew, oh. and I should have known, I should have thought of this before I even did it. So it was a ceiling fan with, it was the only light in the room, ceiling fan with like, I don't know, five light bulbs in it. Yep. And uh, it's hideous and I wanted to get rid of it. I wanted to get rid of it from pretty much the day we moved into the house, but I wasn't about to, you know, rip out the only functioning light. Anyway, <laughs> finally got to it. I'm like, I'm going to do this took out the fan, put in the new light, and realized, wait a minute, there's no way to turn this on and off. It's just always on. <laughs> and so <laughs> I knew I was going to have to run new cable or do something. Yep. It, run new cable was the thing that jumped to my mind immediately because I have like 100 foot of Romex, Romex. sitting around. <laughs> right. Um, and also I had bought all new switches for, you know, the entire house that I have not switched out all of them yet. So yep. I had a whole box of switches left. I was like, this is going to be easy. Um except that in the attic there was this huge platform that the previous owners had built to be able to store some stuff up in that mouse house that is my attic. Right. Um, So I had to demolish parts of that to be able to access the top plate to run the new cable, which didn't take long. No. But there were like at least half a dozen people, including Mike Gurton and a bunch of other fantastic listeners who had much better ideas that would have made my life a lot easier. And I wish we sort of broadcast this thing like live radio so that we could get that instant feedback. But right. it was like two weeks before. <laughs> like I think we recorded like two weeks before it aired. And so I had already, you know, gone through the butt pain of ripping all that out and running the cable before we got any of this great stuff. And so the, stuff. the suggestions uh, were all... Uh, technology based, right? Mm-hmm. This is something that you couldn't have done even 20 years ago, right? Right. So the first thing someone wrote in was t- a smart light bulb, mm-hmm. and you can control that with your phone. You don't use any switch or whatever. To me, that seems kind of weird to like have to carry your phone around the mm-hmm. house all the time to turn a light on and off. Yeah. But it's a great solution if 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 that works for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Other folks su- suggested these uh, RF 
type uh, switches that use a radio signal and a, and, a, and a switch up in the light fixture canopy that turns the light on and off based yeah. on this radio signal, right? Mm-hmm. And then there are a number of smart home solutions, right? Mm-hmm. Clap yeah. on, clap off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nobody suggested. Nobody suggested a clapper. I don't even know if those exist anymore. Of course they? they do. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, so Kevin was one folk, uh, one of the folk who uh, wrote to us about this subject, and he says, uh, "Hey, FHB podcast team, longtime listener here. I'm a huge fan of the podcast. Listening to your modeling problems really helps me cope with mine. <laughs> After listening to your podcast while mowing the lawn, my wife always asks me how my therapy session went." I normally just curse about someone tiling in a dishwasher or an orphaned water heater. <laughs> I'm sure it's just incoherent babbling to her, but she doesn't have to feign interest in waterproofing <laughs> details. So on behalf of my wife, keep up the good work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was listening to Matt's Light Saga on episode 216. As much as I love cutting out plaster and steel lath and fishing wires through vermiculite-filled wall cavities, once I discovered the Green Cycle Smart wireless wall light switch i stopped doing it it's just a rocker switch that you can stick on the wall that controls a wireless receiver relay that you can mount in your ceiling light junction box you can have one switch control two relays so matt could replace his existing receptacle switch with a relay and turn on all the lights with one switch for example i have three installed at my house and they have never missed a signal they're cheap enough and quick enough to install that i would give it a shot before cutting apart the storage platforms in the attic and fishing wires here's a link so I looked this up on uh, Amazon, and what I found to be cool is that the receiver that goes in the uh, junction box or the light canopy is very small, so it doesn't seem like it would create a problem in there. Mm -hmm. And then looks like a switch. You just stick to the wall. What are the code requirements for that? Do you know? I don't know. I wonder if you have to stick that above the drywall and make it because the connections still have to be in the box. Oh yeah. The connect, the, the whole thing goes in the box and then okay. there's like a little antenna that sticks out. I believe so I probably would have had to put in a new J box by that time just to make enough room. Unless the light fixture has a big enough canopy to, to hold it in there. Yeah. So it's about an inch, uh, wide and tall and an in, and to an inch and a half long. So it, yeah. it's, it's not very big. Yeah. This didn't, it probably had less than half an inch of depth. So you, it, then a, you, it's an led fixture. So then you'd have to put a, a bigger junction box in or some. Yeah, it's some not makes, worth it. <laughs> yeah. Not for me. It's a great solution. It in is, some, though. some, yeah. some situations for sure. And like it allows you to put the switch anywhere. So if, if there would be, for example, obstructions in the wall that would prevent you from fishing a wire from the top down yeah. or the bottom up, it would be a good solution. So well, I still have two more ceiling fans in my house. <laughs> You'll get a chance to try it. I don't know what these people's <laughs> obsession with ceiling fans was. I think they just were, I, and there was an air, they left an air conditioner behind too. It wasn't like they weren't using air conditioning. Well, so I think in the eighties and nineties, like ceiling fans were all the rage. Yeah. I just think they mm-hmm. were just, they have that eighties look to them too. Yeah. Ugh. And like my, in, in that period, my parents put ceiling fans in every room, even ones they didn't use. <laughs> yeah. I would think you would enjoy them. You run so hot. Yeah, I'd rather just run the air conditioning. Yeah, yeah I'm with you there. But I mean, we I do have other fans, you know, but like high velocity fans, right. and I don't have to sit underneath the <laughs> right. ceiling fan that's in the corner of the room for some inexplicable reason. Right. <laughs> don't get him started. I this, know, please. no, I've heard all about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just stop right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that was fun uh, to hear from all of you folks with those very good suggestions. I appreciate it. I appreciate it too, mm-hmm. and yeah. I hope to use it in the near-ish future mm. it's uh, something we've seen uh in our careers right that like didn't exist yeah. uh previously right. there, yeah. there was no solution except to fish a wire mm. yep cool and speaking of light fixtures <laughs> what is that <laughs> what is what oh oh yeah it just oh so God. happens prior to any of this conversation, because I didn't catch up on Matt's story until this morning. <laughs> this is a thing that I need to get rid of. Is that what the one that's yes. smashed up? Yes. <laughs> you so definitely so made it work. Can you on, explain it to listeners? Because yes. I, I cannot. I'll try. It's not easy to explain. <laughs> so day one of moving into my house, this thing used to be um, upright. So if you can picture that back piece running horizontal mm-hmm. to the floor. It's a, So it's a very old light fixture. Very, well, no, it's an 80s light fixture meant to look like it's very old. The Victorian old. type. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's hideous. It was hideous. It and had it has these ex- weird... Does it have globes or are they just missing? <laughs> 
<laughs> they are missing because I smashed them to uh -huh. pieces just to get. I thought I would just take this right down, but as it turned out, I kind of got nervous about it um, because all the wiring goes into a, a cubby hole beneath the um, staircase, and I'm just. Oh, that sounds safe. I know I'm really uncomfortable <laughs> with it. So this is what it looks like now. But I, it is my next project. I'm going to try to figure out how to get it out of there. It's probably super easy. Yeah. It's super easy. Yeah. So when you pull that thing forward, you can see all the wiring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's <laughs> usually like little wiring little nuts me. or screws that I took hold those the, out. Yeah, They're just hanging by the wires. The wires. Now. Yeah, yeah. Then you pull it out with the power turned off. Yes. And uh, disconnect the wire nuts and put whatever fixture uh, back. Yeah. So that's my next project. Cool. But I just wanted you to see the current state of it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see what's wrong with it. Um, I've stopped noticing it, like the fans. It looks like some sort Doesn't of it look sad? high school like installation art dripping. project. It does look like an installation, <laughs> yes. All right, well, so it just, cool. ha it just so happens that that's what I was thinking. So do you doing. have something picked out? I don't, but your, your thing inspired me to start looking. So uh, coincidentally, mm -hmm. uh, this is like the light fixture show, apparently. <laughs> um, I, too, after having a bear bulb in our bedroom uh, for at least a year. Um, I don't know how you lived with that. Did you, did I you have either. table lamps too, so you didn't yeah, have to use it? Yeah, okay. so it was only used when, like, you you had the laundry basket in the mm. and the in your arms, and you wanted to turn the light on to put clothes sure. away, and then you turn it off. We never like yeah. hung out with that on. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but I woke up one morning and looked at it, and I'm like, this is really sad. This is just a very sad existence. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Feels sort of cell like. So uh, I said to Carol, like, let's go to the home center or lighting showroom and buy a light fixture. And like, we just never got around to it. So w one evening, I was like, this needs to get resolved. So I was like, pulled up Amazon, uh, scrolled through a couple fixtures, and showed her this one. She's like, that's okay. So uh, we bought it, and I think it was one hundred and ten dollars. Uh, and it's a little sparkly for my normal aesthetic. Um, I oh, love yeah. it. It's cool, right? Yeah, it's a little bedazzled. <laughs> it's very feminine, <laughs> let's just say. Carol probably loves it. Does she love it? Well, I think we both do. I think mm. it's really cool. It is really so, cool. So uh, for those of you listening, it's like uh, branches, like limbs, right? Mm -hmm. Little branches. And then instead of like leaves, they are crystals, faceted crystals. And uh, it's hard to believe you can buy something like this for 100 bucks. Mm -hmm. um, I think it looks like it diffuses the light nicely. So uh, part of that is the photography. The thing was mm. blinding, right, <laughs> with the bulbs that we got. So mm -hmm. I put a dimmer in to mm. control that. So that one gentleman who wrote in asking about dimmers, and I said they were something I didn't use anymore. Well, I lied. Um, <laughs> I'm just thinking about you're going to have to dust that a lot. So interestingly, they, they give you a little, like, glove like you'd see in Downton mm. Abbey, you <laughs> know, a white little linen <laughs> glove. To oh, plant. I could get so, into that. So I'm going <laughs> to be up keep, there doing that. Got to keep track of that glove. <laughs> I threw it away immediately. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. So that's cool. That, you know, it's amazing, like, what spending $100 in, uh, you know, an hour, mm -hmm. how much that can change the look of a space. Mm -hmm. That's very true. Light fixtures make a big difference. I think most are ugly. This one's not too bad. Well, should we get to some questions? Sure. So uh, Mikey from Silicon Valley writes, uh, hello, FHB podcast team. I love your show and the fantastic discussion on general building and high performance homes. Is he talking about our show? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, coupled with wildly entertaining social interactions, that I believe, uh, I'd appreciate any thoughts on the selection of iJoy slash trusses versus dimensional lumber for new construction, given how framing fares in a fire. This news clip is a good example, and I've heard similar comments from architects slash firefighters out there. Um, lightweight construction creates serious safety concerns. Um, I can see that I joists and trusses offer design and time cost benefits to, uh, counteract higher building costs, but in a fire situation, however rare it may be dimensional lumber, uh, jump dimensional lumber's hardiness seems pretty compelling and potentially may offer greater safety for firefighters themselves. Then again, maybe a fire situation would probably be, catas be catastrophic for both occupants and the structure if the fire burns long enough to compromise the framing and structural integrity. Uh, wow. So he sent a link to uh, a local TV news spot story, right? Channel 13 somewhere in Indiana. I see uh, Bloomington on the screen capture I got. And uh, this little 
uh, video has the newscaster going out to uh, a fire training facility where the firefighters have set a couple floor joists up on sawhorses. One is a 2 by 10 the other is an I-joist with an OSB web and uh, LVL flanges. And they put a couple concrete blocks on the top of it, start a fire underneath, and show uh, the difference in combustibility and structural integrity once they burn for a while. Mm -hmm. Can you guess what happens, Matt? The iJoist fails <laughs> very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. I didn't watch this, but I, I did sit through an APA webinar about a year ago on a similar topic. And, yeah, it was pretty surprising, like, how quickly these iJoists fail in a fire compared to a 2 by 10 which, you think it's surprising? I mean, there's a fraction of the lumber involved, right? There, there is, yeah. And I, so I don't know that it's really surprising, but, I mean, you know, you think these things, they're capable of spanning much farther than dimensional lumber, and so you think, oh, this thing has to be stronger. Strong. Yeah. But it's got a very thin web that burns, burns up like real heck. quick. Yeah. I read in the Fire Engineering magazine, they came down pretty hard on eye joists, and there was some test results um, from the Fire Service Institute at the University of Illinois that showed that um, I-beams fail at four, four minutes and 40 seconds. And what I thought was interesting is that there's no sagging or warning noises, which means that firefighters they just fail they catastrophically. They just don't know that there's yeah. some structural problem. Um, yeah. So there's serious threat to firefighters. In the, in the lo news video that I watched, um, so the, the web burned out first, not surprisingly, because mm -hmm. it's very thin. Right. And the flanges were still intact, but then when the guy went to s step on it, like, it did. It, cr it collapsed mm -hmm. because the, the web is gone. the keys to the kingdom mm -hmm. with regard to an eye joist. That's mm -hmm. how the engineering works. Yeah. And I don't know if there's, you know, like, labeling requirements for residential structures or if that's, like, a state thing or a municipal thing. But, like, when you look at commercial buildings, a lot of times you'll have, like, those little tags outside the building. I don't know if people pay attention to this. It'll say like 4R, which will be like, you know, basically whatever type truss or uh, eye joist or whatever it is, roof, mm -hmm. like the R's roof, I think F floor or whatever, um, just to basically give warning to the firefighters when they go in that building. And a lot of times it, what I understand is they'll walk up to that, see that <laughs> symbol on the wall and just turn like, around. Nope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not going in there. Huh. Wow. I, uh, well, it's good for them to have that information before yeah, going in. Yeah, I mean, it's in. basically just keeping them safe. Yeah. You know, is, it, is this a structure worth saving, I think, is what it comes down to. Yeah, right. The industry is aware of this problem and have come up with a number of solutions. Perhaps the, the easiest is to put a drywall layer to protect the, the joists from mm -hmm. flame. Yeah. And that works pretty well. It, yeah. it greatly, greatly increases the... Um, duration with which the thing can be exposed to high temperature and flame. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. And uh, sprinklers do the same, but nobody wants sprinklers in their house in this country. Uh, yeah. And nobody wants to, builders do not want to put sprinklers in, in houses. Yeah. Why? The cost. Mm. And, and Matt said uh, earlier, it's a good point, is like uh, if you're in a heating climate, you have to have sprinkler heads in all rooms, and that means they're going to be in the, in the attic or in the attic on, above the ceiling and the second floor, which means they're potentially going to be exposed to freezing temperatures and create problems that way. Yeah. And they, they, nobody seems to have come up with a good solution for that yet, for how to make that really work. So a lot of, a lot of states, even if they've adopted the, the, you know, 2015, 2018 codes that have this in there, they have sort of deferred, like, action on that. They've exempted residential structures in most cases. Yeah. But there's, if you want to see, there's a, APA has a whole bunch of different ways that you can sort of make eye joists a little more fire resistant and mm -hmm. they've got all that stuff up on their website. We can put a link to that. That's a good idea. I, uh, this got me thinking. So I, I went looking to see like our, our structure, co structural collapse or is structural collapse really how people are injured in fires. And the truth is homeowners or residents know that most fires are cooking fires and fatalities are often related to intoxication and um, mobility problems. If people are sleeping, obviously, there's a greater risk that they'll succumb to a fire or smoke. Um, obviously, having smoke detectors is a huge uh, benefit. Like, 
uh, a significant percentage of people who die in structure fires are because they don't have working smoke detectors in their house. Not is, surprisingly. Yeah. Right. Is this mostly for like single family homes? Yes. Or, okay. Yeah. yeah. But the people who are really at risk are firefighters. Once something is broken out and folks are out of the house and they're charged with saving the structure, mm-hmm. um, I don't think there's a good way to argue that these products are as safe in a fire as saw and, saw and wood. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But just that's just a, that's just the reality. Yeah. Structure fires are very rare. So, I mean. What do you have there? This is the NF- NFPA research report. And uh, structure fires, uh, as reported by year, um, have gone down significantly since 1980. Um, People were doing a lot of drugs back then. I, <laughs> I think it has more to do with the public awareness campaigns with regard to working smoke detectors. Mm. I, I think that has a lot to do with it. Yeah. And insurance companies um, remind you of that stuff too now, right? Probably a lot less smoking in bed. And there's there a lot. The there's a lot less <laughs> smoking yeah. for sure. Yeah. Most fires are related to cooking, which yeah. I was not surprising. Uh, so, uh, in 2018, the year of this report, there were 360,000 structure fires, approximately, in the U.S. That sounds of, like a lot. Yeah. It's rare, though. I mean, compared to how many millions of housing units we have. I guess. I don't know. Well, there's 300 million Americans. Like, yeah. So there are millions of residential units and only 300,000 of them catch fire. Only. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'm being a... Maybe I'm not... Uh, so deaths per uh, thousand fires uh, are at f- 7.5. So even if you have a structure fire... The number of fatalities is, right. is low, yeah. but firefighters like they respond to every fire, right? Mm-hmm. And whether there's someone in there or not, they they are charged with trying to save the structure. So they they should be wary. And this is a problem uh, similar similar problems we've been talking about iJoyce, but uh, engineer trusses, floor and roof trusses have similar problems. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, because you're building with two by fours you're building with small sticks of wood yeah. and uh my understanding and I, I haven't found the source for this today but is that the truss plates that these trusses rely on for their strength um tend to pop off quickly in a fire mm. they they they, they yeah. even they, before the thing burns through the 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 plates get hot or and pop off yeah. are they usually nailed or screwed they're na- they just, they're pressed they're nails yeah mm. they have like basically sharp little things you know that the way these things are manufactured they have little points that mm-hmm. kind of drive into, into the, the wood. into the into the wood but mm-hmm. they don't go in that far mm-hmm. and okay. since it's the surface of the wood that burns first it makes sense that the plate yeah. would pop yeah. before the thing is burned through um i'm going to put the national fire prevention association uh report up on the podcast page cuz it's just very interesting to me like, who, who, what causes these fires? How do they spread? Mm-hmm. It's very interesting. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, really current. 2019 is this is uh, dated. Cool. Uh, good question, Mikey. Thank you. Uh, Bill from Colorado writes, uh, Hi, folks. I enjoy the podcast. Keep up the good work. I'm planning on using iJoyce on my cabin project. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> <laughs> the fastening specification says that I need to use 0.135 inch by 3.5 inch nails for the n- plate nail. So for those of you listening who don't know what a plate nail is, I didn't. Um, it refers to the nails that go through the wall's bottom plate into the uh, rim board and the eye joists, right, to secure the exterior walls to the floor system. Mm-hmm. And so a 135-inch, 0.135-inch nail, uh, near as I can tell, is... Like, not available for a nail gun. And if there's any out there that you folks know of, please let us know. But I searched from vir- every manufacturer I could think of looking for something that would satisfy this requirement, and I can't find any. Yeah. So, uh, you got a hand nail, 16 bucks. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is, I don't know what this is based on. Yeah. I don't um, so, Bill asked, can I get away with 131 nails? And, uh, we can't answer that. We can't answer that. That's like the so this these products are tested and you have to assemble them to weigh the manufacturer says to satisfy the uh, requirements in the IRC. And uh, so I called them up this morning and asked, uh, "Where do you buy these nails?" <laughs> and the guy's like, 
I don't know. Uh, let me get back to you. <laughs> and so we determined that the 131 is a, a box nail, a 16 box, not a 16 common. Okay. A 16 common is uh, 0.162 inches in diameter. Mm -hmm. uh, the box is 0.135, and a right. gun nail is almost always 0.131. So right. you're going to have to hand nail this. Right. Do you think anyone's doing that, Matt? Uh, I, I bet there's still guys out there, the Larry Hans of the world. That are, are you still kidding out me? There <laughs> and they like stuff. No, there's no. nobody doing that. So interestingly, I don't want to give the guy's name because I don't want to give him in trouble. But uh, what what I heard him say is like, oh, yeah, I don't think anyone's paying attention to that. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's right. <laughs> I think most guys <laughs> like are just that's right too. Buying whatever is on the shelf that will fit in their gun. They're like three and a half inches. Good. So I, I never do this, but I brought my phone uh, with me to the podcast today to see if they have emailed me uh, with any update. <laughs> and uh, let's see. Um, um, I um, would guess not. <laughs> let's see. It would be a bit. Yeah, they're going to have to go back to the drawing board. No, they have not. No. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, really, you just got to go to the manufacturer. I mean, if you're doing sawn lumber, you know, there are, there's a nailing schedule in the code. And yeah. it gives you a whole bunch of options for this kind of connection, really for all connections. Um, but, you know, if you're dealing with a manufacturer spec that you have to go by in order to be code compliant and they only give you one option, <laughs> that's your option. Unless you talk to them and they give you an alternative. The other question he asked is like, so he found a uh, 0.162 inch nails, right? And, um, which is the common diameter. Mm -hmm. And he says, can I use those? And I, I could only find those starting at four inches, which means you need a special nail gun. And if you're driving those into an eye joist, it's going to go through the flange and potentially split it or reduce the strength of it because it's not supposed to. Yeah. It's not yeah. supposed to get the wet to the web. Mm -hmm. mm. And these flanges, they're not, you know, the, some of them are LVL, some of them are sawn lumber. You know, a lot of it's just like finger jointed, crap, you know, solid, yeah. two by whatever. And uh, it's gonna yeah, split. that stuff is going to split. Man, I got to know a lot about nails. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would love to know if, like, there are any inspectors out there that either listeners have experienced or themselves uh, uh inspectors who pay attention to this because I, I i can't imagine you would find anyone in compliance with these rules on a normal construction site i just i don't imagine yeah i'd love to hear do you from guys pay inspector. attention to that when you're building like when you did your barn well so i used solid solid sawn joists mm. um more because of cost than nails yeah. I've built a house with trusses, but I don't remember what we used. I Whatever my boss handed me. Yeah, so I can say the same for me is like when I have done uh I joist floor systems, yeah, we haven't we've used the one three one nails, I know, because I remember the nail sure. gun I used. Yeah. Yeah. And you pointed out earlier this morning that that connection is more forgiving than others in in that um Part of the house, right? The yeah. rim board to joist to wall tr transition. Yeah. And why do you say that? Well, the rim is really what's, in my understanding, what is preventing that floor system from rolling over. And it's sort of taking all of the sort of wind loads and everything that are hitting those walls, all that's getting transferred to the floor system. So making sure you have the right nails through the rim into those joists is probably more important than the connection between the bottom of the wall plate and the rim it's, not that it's not important it is but i mean if you run the sheathing down that's what i was gonna to say the, to the rim or even to the the mud sill then you know that's you a, should be good yeah that's a very strong connection because yeah. the na there's na a lot of nails there. there's a lot of nails yeah yep. but very good question where are we at now three ben from iowa do you want to read it no. I can't find it. <laughs> <laughs> you want mine? No, I'm kidding. Um, I really can't. Here we go. Uh, ben from Iowa. Hey, FHB folks. Thanks for all the insight that you deliver weekly in the form that many of us tradespeople can consume while we're working. I'm in the process of building a new workshop and have a couple of questions. 
First, I've chosen a mono slope slash shed roof in order to have a clear span of 22 feet. I decided to enlist wooden eye joists as rafters. I didn't even make this connection, Matt. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I didn't either. Which Justin talked about several times in the early days of the podcast. My first question is how to vent this roof. And if if I should, would you tuck vents into the eaves on the top and bottom and use foam to create a channel the entire way? I thought in this case I would do a layer of foam that returned to the eaves and fluffy insulation behind that. My second question is, is in a vented roof assembly, where is the air barrier? I have read a lot of people online suggesting plywood or OSB sheathing with tape seamed as an air barrier, but if the roof is vented below, this can't be the air barrier, right? Right. Yes. <laughs> That's very true. Yeah. Same with the insulation. I mean, I've seen drawings where people have, you know, like, foam on top of the roof and then it's vented underneath right. it's like what What's what are point? you doing right. yes. what are you <laughs> i don't know um let's let's tackle those and then he has a question about a wood stove okay yeah. so uh low slope roofs don't vent right. very well it's just yeah. like they don't it doesn't work mm-hmm. you need a very good roof slip i don't know if this qualifies or not as enough slope i'm saying why vent it mm-hmm. just don't yeah, I th- insulate on top of the roof sheathing, put some fluffy insulation on the underside of the sheathing, and you'll have an amazing uh, roof assembly. Shed roofs like that aren't typically vented, are they? Well, you you can do it, and you can I, do it, but are they? Is it often done? I, I think in the heyday of like these homes from the '80s, I saw they all had vented roofs, mm. and they're probably all rotting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, if you wanted to vent it. He was talking about using foam up there. I would probably use some sort of sheet good, but, you know, either plywood or OSB sort of And staple. make your own vent channels. Don't rely on the cheap foam <laughs> ones. Yeah, don't. I wouldn't use foam. Just those things are going to flex like crazy because you are you can dense pack in there afterwards. You can put up, you know, your plywood or OSB, just kind of, you know, crown staple it to the underside of the top flange and then, you know, dense pack all day and you've got whatever the depth of the flange is as you're vent cavity but i don't know that i love that idea but i don't know how else you do it i put the foam on the outside Mm. of the sheathing it's like a perfect roof for that it it would be so easy and it'll help with thermal bridging a lot yeah yeah it's i think that's a better option i don't we've talked about roof venting so much i mean you know you're not (laughs) it's it's not keeping the shingles cooler or anything like that i mean shingle manufacturers may say that you have to have a vented roof but they're never going to honor that warranty anyway, as we've said many times. Yes. Um, you know, I don't know. What's the R value of a roof with the assembly that you just described? Well, it depends with on how much foam you there. Okay. So you can figure like between four and five per inch. Mm-hmm. So depending on where you're at in the country, right. you can have a mix of rigid insulation on top of the sheathing and, and then uh, fluffy stuff in, inside. Yeah. yeah. And you can usually adjust those R values like the, the you know, you have to have like here, like what, 49 is the R value requirement yes, for, so. yep. for roof. And you can usually uh, move that down a little bit if you have continuous insulation on the outside. Because mm-hmm. it works that better. Sense, yeah. yeah, because it works better. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, the whole uh, R value, the, the whole assembly R value goes up mm-hmm. with continuous insulation. So uh, my second question in a vented roof assembly, where is the air barrier? So the, the drywall in this instance is your air barrier. So if you're going to have ceiling lights try and seal around the boxes and stay away from can lights, that kind of stuff. Like any penetrations you make are compromising that air barrier. Uh, third question is about a wood stove chimney. I intend to use ag panels as roofing, hoping to keep the snow load minimal and being in rural Iowa, the aesthetic will be fine. But it seems like sealing a boot for a chimney may be difficult on a metal roof. So he's talking about the flashing boot. Mm-hmm. And, um, so on those, like, they have a rectangular base that's flat and then a conical section that goes around the manufactured chimney. And you're just going to tuck the tops, the upper part of that flange in a slot you cut in the metal roof. And it's, it's going to work great. That sounds terrible. Don't Why? they make ones you can, like, rip it down or something? So there are ones that can screw down and mm-hmm. they have, uh, you know, a layer of butyl sealing around the bottom. And I think that's fine, too. I, I, I don't know if they make them for, like, manufactured chimneys specifically. And you really are, need to use all the parts from one manufacturer that are designed to work together in those systems. And, and they have details for metal roofing. It's, it's not all that uncommon. I, I saw it all the time in northern New England because mm-hmm. everyone has a metal roof mm-hmm. and everyone has a wood stove practically. So Yeah. 
The flashing That's solvable. Counter fla yeah, there's a lot of flashing, counter flashing details out there for this kind of thing. And you can you could put a little trick cricket, you know, like yeah. um, that. This is solvable. So, and he suggested that he could put the chimney on the outside of the building, mm -hmm. right, and 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 solve this problem that way because then he wouldn't have a roof penetration. But mm -hmm. those kind of chimneys just don't work as well because they're cold mm -hmm. and they don't draft as well and they have a lot uh, faster creosote buildup. So I would say stay away from those chimneys in a cold climate mm -hmm. always. That's what I have. Yes, <laughs> that's what I've got. You just go up on the roof, clean it <laughs> out, like, clean it out. A lot of people have them, you know. I Those think it, boots, though, when it's when it is that configuration, they and at least in my case, they rust and then they stain your house siding if you have vinyl anyway. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know that? <laughs> because I'm living with I'm it. Just, I know. <laughs> uh, so don't go through the wall. Go through the roof. Put your insulation on the roof. Get on with your life. <laughs> That's my favorite expression of yours. Uh, that, that, you know, some questions we have difficulty answering because there's no good answer. I think mm. this is a one that's pretty locked down. Mm, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Who are we going to hear from? I don't Joe? know. I don't know why he needs a wood stove. Because wood stoves are awesome, awesome yeah. right? But I also don't like ag panels on on homes. This is a shop. Oh, well, in that case, fine. <laughs> you don't like screw down roofing. I like it for. Ag buildings uh -huh. and buildings that you're not living in. So but what's no. your beef with screw down roofing? Well, one, I mean, you're poking 10,000 holes in your... <laughs> it's only hundreds. <laughs> it's only hundreds, yeah. Depending, yeah, I guess if you've got a small roof, it's only hundreds. Or 10,000 if you've got a big roof. Um, and all of those little neoprene gaskets are going to fail. Eventually. And then you're going to have to go up and take out all those screws and replace them. You're and that sounds right. terrible to But me. it's it costs a fraction of what other roofing, metal roofing oh, systems. Yeah. Yeah. And it probably I mean, goes down faster, right? It goes down very fast. Yeah. Rob did that on my little woodshed, and he was telling me what the issues would be if you yeah. applied well, he that did to the, the house. corrugated. Yeah, that's, that's true. even probably easier. Yeah. So I had this on my... I had a screw down metal roofing on my house in Stowe, and um, I, no one has changed the screws, and that was that's been almost 20 years now. Yeah. All that water's accumulating in the insulation, it's, it's, that's why. <laughs> no one has noticed. Right yeah. 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 It's going to reach a critical mass and just come, the whole ceiling's going to come <laughs> crashing down while they sleep. A lot of people feel like you do, yeah. uh, but there's a lot of screw-down metal roofs in, in northern New England, I can yeah. tell you. It's very commonplace. Yeah. And if There's a reason they're called ag panels, though. Mm -hmm. Unless you're a cow, you shouldn't be sleeping <laughs> under them. <laughs> uh, Matt. I love it. I think it's cool, too, looking. They, they look fine. I, I had playing Galvaloom on our house, and uh, what was cool about it is it reflected the sky, so it, it always looked different. It, mm. it just it mm. just was very pretty. Yeah, couldn't have imagined. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, moving on. Uh, hey, FHB crew, this is from Joe. I thought there might make a. I thought of a good topic for discussion. There have been several small discussions on the show regarding climate change, and in the immortal uh, in the immortal words of Brian, he calls it science. Yeah, climate science. I <laughs> yeah, think is science what he refers to it as. Uh, but there is much more discussion regarding building climate specific homes as well as building homes des des to des design to last to hundreds of years. Am I the only one who thinks that to build a home that lasts hundreds of years in a world with a changing climate, one must build in a way that is suitable for any climate? So his point is that. If you're planning for a structure to last 500 years, it's most likely the climate is going to be different at the mm -hmm. end of that period than the beginning. I feel like in sustainability Possible. circles, people speak of, you know, the, the longevity of a house in terms of 75 to 100 years. I mean, how many people are, how many builders do you know that are thinking, this so is going to last 500 oh, well, years? So I think you have to move outside the U.S. Mm. Am I right? Possibly. Yeah. I mean, there are houses certainly in the area that we live in and we're talking to you from right now. <laughs> that yes. Are hundreds hundred, of years old. Yeah, true. Um, but I don't know that the people who built them necessarily thought this is going to be here 400 years from now or whatever. My guess is in many cases, they were just trying not to freeze to death. Yeah. Right. yeah. A lot of them were just stacking up rocks. Yeah. We see yeah. <laughs> <laughs> often the oldest housing stock is uh, made well, but not always. Right. It's, mm -hmm. it's like... How, if someone needed it, it stuck around. Um, this also leads into the climate zone map that Building Science Corp. is so fond of, but which I my, myself find a degradation. 
Uh, someone looking at that map would think that Big Bear, California, is obviously in a hot, dry climate because microclimates are not even taken into account. California alone has 16 separate microclimates, which are established in state building codes. Building a home for a hot, dry climate in Big Bear would be akin to building a house out of dirt in Seattle. <laughs> Thoughts, he says. That was from Joe. Yeah. What a great point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've heard, I've heard that his climate could be described also as mixed dry. I don't know if that matters, but it probably impacts assemblies. Yeah. But, I mean, to his larger point, though, I mean, what do you do <laughs> if you're building a house for hundreds of years? Do you like what are what's the thought process that goes into that? Are you th- and considering climate change as a possibility? So I think change is the uh, operative Key word there. Word, right? yeah. yeah, like yeah. I don't think you build a house for 500 years expecting it's not going to change. Yeah, mm-hmm. you, it should be adaptable. I exactly. think the best architecture is like changeable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, build something that can easily be retrofitted Adapted. to whatever. Right. Yeah. And who who knows what technologies are going to be different 500 also, years from now? Who knows what your climate's going to be 500 yeah. years yeah. from now? I mean, when I think about those old houses in the town I grew up in, I mean, some of these houses were built in the 1600s. And like, even as a kid going in there, I was almost hitting my head on the ceiling. <laughs> right. Because like people have gotten much bigger. Right. Yeah. So I mean, you know, true. Uh, you don't know what's going to happen in terms of, you know, just like giants, evolution or giants whatever, you know, around, right? uh, like access to protein. We might need those 9,000 <laughs> square feet houses. Yeah. I mean, everybody start building 12 foot tall ceilings just in case. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that um, the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy offers these best practices guides and case studies from all over the country. And this guy... The best practices for what, Kylie? Um, for, for building... Sustainably, and, and, yeah. Okay. And there's case study. Uh, I mentioned the case studies. I, I think he might find it interesting, and he would want to look at volume nine. And I can uh, include a link. Oh, I'd say it, start with volume nine at least. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's specific <laughs> to his climate. That's okay. why I recommend it. So, what is volume nine? Big Bear. It's just the case studies from his oh, region. Oh, I, under- I understand. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Just and it gives you all kinds of assemblies and what people are doing. And I just think he might find it interesting since he's considering this issue i i've always said you you build for where you where the house is right. like and you look to houses that and other structures that have survived the test of time for clues on how to do that and houses that are comfortable do do those things right like that's why we see uh regional variations in our in our housing stock in this country because the climate is very different also, the access to materials is different. Very much. That's why you had, like, you know, straw bale houses out in Nebraska right. to begin with. Those yeah. will last 500 years. And in Bucks yeah. County, yeah. like, they were stone because it was all stone, mm-hmm. you know? Yep. Um, interestingly, so I, I did some research on uh, what the contrasts are between Big Bear and the, uh, San Bernardino, which is the largest metro area. Uh, nearby, right? And it's it's close. It's like 20 miles away. And um, so it precipitation at Big Bear is uh, averages 21 inches a year. So, I mean, it's not exactly like a lot of rain, mm-hmm. but it's definitely going to be different than desert Southern California, right? Mm-hmm. And that would classify as mixed dry, right? Yeah. In contrast to most of Southern California, Big Bear Lake region it normally receives significant winter snow because of its high elevation. Uh, snowfall is measured at lake level, averages 72 inches, and upwards of 100 inches can accumulate on the forested ridges. Lucky bastards. So it's beautiful there. It made me want to go there when I was We looking. live in the tropics now. Yeah. <laughs> I miss snow. I think it must be really hard to build for, I mean, you can build for today's climate, but if you're thinking long-term climate specific builds with climate change in mind is tricky business. Agreed. And yeah, (laughs) I don't think it's cost effective to like try and and build for any foreseeable uh, climatic change. Yeah. That's why when I talk to builders and architects, they often use the 75 to hundred year target yeah. For what they're building. Because someone's going to remodel it. Mm. Inevitably, you know, it's like it's not going to stay the same just mm-hmm. because people's tastes change mm-hmm. and stuff wears out. Yeah. That said, if you just air seal and insulate the heck out of it, 
you can be prepared you never for have almost to do anything. Another thing. Yeah. I think that's a good point. And, and if you build a you know a resilient envelope, uh, it's going to keep the structure around no matter what rain or s- storm and stuff we have. Right? I don't know. All these old houses that surround us don't have any of that, and they're still here. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that they're comfortable. That's true. You know, that's true. Or efficient. They're definitely not, not that. <laughs> Um, so our friends uh, who star in the HGTV series Windy City Rehab are back in the news. <laughs> How many yeah, times have we talked about them? Well, I, th- I think once. Oh, just once? Well, that's we probably too much. We talk about them much. in the office a lot. <laughs> we do. So th- for those of you who uh, are regular listeners of the show may remember these folks were um, banished from by the city of Chicago from applying for new building permits and had stop work orders uh, – Left and, right. left and right, and uh, it's surprising to me to hear that they're being sued. <laughs> surprising <laughs> to me to hear that they have a second season coming out. Mm. Yeah, so apparently uh, uh, some folks who bought one of their uh, townhomes um, is, I don't know, uh, disappointed. They're dissatisfied that their house is, like, pouring water <laughs> inside. <laughs> Crummy on every level. Aren't they also being sued by a builder? Because he didn't get paid? Oh, that'll be in next week's show. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to pick on these people, but like, if, if you're putting yourself out there as someone to follow on television because they do whatever it is they do, like, shouldn't you be like playing your best game? You would hope. Yeah, you're attracting attention. You better be doing everything by the rules. I don't like because it's gonna be doc- it's documented. Like everything that you're doing that's bad is on camera. They don't even need to show up to your job site. You just need to watch HGTV. I, you know, I, I, these shows are often on when I go to the uh, doctor's office or the dentist because I think it's pretty middle of the road, right? Yep. Like it's not, it's, it has a, a broad appeal and not like non controversial, but it should be controversial because a lot of the practices are bad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Bad. Cooking shows would be a better choice. I see a lot of those too. <laughs> cake cake decorating don't you find it surprising that these people have succeeded enough to get a tv show well for another season too they've been in the news so much i can't imagine that it... i have no idea i've never watched it the producer is going to be dick wolf on the next season so no. how is that, Who's right? that the guy who did law and order and all those cop shows oh. <laughs> i don't know is if that that's going to affect the quality of the work I mean, it was trying trying to be a joke <laughs> okay oh. <laughs> shows us shows do you how watch much those shows jeff yeah What's your favorite? Oh, I don't know. I just it's brain candy. It's not. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us that the, what you've seen most? Which which ones? I mean, Law and Order has been on for a million years. So oh, you're I talking about the, the, the HGTV <laughs> shows? Oh no, I don't watch no. any. any. He's got a poster of the Property Brothers in his office. Don't let him lie. <laughs> <laughs> I like those guys. I like those shows. I mean, you do? I don't support them because I, I think they probably, most of them. Matt, was it you sent around the, the, e- the email describing, like, why there's so much, like, demolition in those shows? Was that you? Yeah, I think it was me. So, Like, the first thing they do is always start knocking down walls. Yeah. And that's to get men to watch that's it. That's to get yeah. men to watch it. Yep. <laughs> Seriously, this is, like, this is part of the formula that in is order that to right? have more men watch it, they want to see, like, walls come down. <laughs> yeah, this is all part of the focus grouping and stuff that they that. do to try to make these shows appealing to a wider audience. <laughs> and that's why they use like sledgehammers, which nobody in the real world does, right? It's like yeah. that is the and worst. And they're always way. in their dress clothes when yeah. they do it. I wonder, like, do you think they use like stud finders and you know all that stuff to make sure there's no plumbing and electrical in there before they start swinging sledgehammers? If, at it? if I thought that they would hit like a cast iron waistline when they were doing that, I would watch those shows. <laughs> yeah. I totally. Everybody's just waiting around for that to happen. Or like they're not delivering, sawing into an electric cable with a you know a sawzall. I would yeah. love to see that on right. camera. Too. Yeah, you got to go to Trailer Park Boys to see that. <laughs> you should put a link to that show. Yeah. If guys so, don't know about it. Matt shared one of the Trailer Boy segments with me one time so of bad. them doing a. Uh, uh, hanging a towel rod in a bathroom, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> Which has to be one of the funniest things I've ever seen. And I'm going to definitely put that up on yes. the podcast so yeah. I can watch it while I, you know, work allegedly. Yeah. <laughs> Might be not suitable for children. <laughs> But it is so Canadian, outrageous. wholesome Canadian programming. It, it might be profane, but it <laughs> yeah. is it is hilarious. Mm-hmm. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. I want to thank uh, 
Jeff, Kylie, and Matt for joining me, and I want to thank all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your questions uh, to fhbpodcast at taunton.com, and please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. And please, 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 please include a mailing address so if we read your comment or question on the air, I can send you a podcast sticker. Program is coming along. Amen. <laughs> I think we're done, right? Thanks, you- thanks everybody. <laughs> Happy building. <laughs> <laughs>